Hoffman Studios presents The Lagoon by Janet Frame, read by Richard Hoffman. At low tide, the water is sucked back into the harbor, and there is no lagoon, only a stretch of dirty gray sand shaded with dark pools of seawater, where you may find a baby octopus if you are lucky, or the spotted orange old house of a crab, or the drowned wreckage of a child's toy boat. There is a bridge over the lagoon where you may look down into the little pools and see your image tangled up with seawater and rushes and bits of cloud. And sometimes at night there is an underwater moon, dim and secret. All this my grandmother told me, my Picton grandmother, who could cut supplejack and find kidney fern and make a track through the thickest part of the bush. When my grandmother died, all the Maori came to her funeral, for she was a friend of the Maoris, and her mother had been a Maori princess, very beautiful, they said, with fierce ways of loving and hating. See the lagoon, my grandmother would say the dirty lagoon, full of drifting wood and seaweed and crab's legs. It is dirty and sandy and smelly in summer. I remember we used to skim round white stones over the water and catch tiddlers in the little creek nearby and make sand castles on the edge. This is my castle, we'd say. You be father, I'll be mother, and will live here and catch crabs and tiddlers forever. I liked my grandmother to talk about the lagoon. And when we went for a holiday to Picton, where Grandma lived, I used to say, Grandma, tell me a story about the Maori Pa, about the old man who lived down the sounds and had a goat and a cow for friends, about the lagoon. And my grandmother would tell me stories of the sounds and the pa and herself when she was young, being a girl and going out to work in the rich people's houses. But the lagoon never had a proper story, or if it had a proper story, my grandmother never told me. See the water, she would say, full of seaweed and crab's claws. But I knew that wasn't the real story, and I didn't find out the real story till I was grown up, and Grandma had died, and most of the old Maoris were gone from the pa, and the old man and the cow and the goat were forgotten. I went for a holiday in Picton. It was a long journey by train, and I was glad at the end of it to see the green and blue town I remembered from childhood, though it was smaller, of course and the trees had shrunk, and the hills were tiny. I stayed with an aunt and uncle. I went for launch rides round the harbor, and I went for picnics with summery people in floral frocks and sun hats, and kids in print frocks or khaki shorts if they were boys, especially if they were boys with fathers in the army. We took baskets with fruit and sandwiches, not tomato, for tomato goes damp, though some like it damp, and three pences in the pocket for ice cream. There were races for the kiddies, and some for the men and women, and afterwards a man walked round the grounds throwing lollies in the air. They were great days out for picnicking in the sounds with the Maoris singing and playing their ukuleles, but they didn't sing the real Maori songs, they sang, You are my sunshine, and south of the border. And then it got dark, and the couples came back from the trees, and the launches were got ready, and everybody went back singing, with the babies crying because they were tired and sunburnt and bitten by sand flies. Sand flies are the devil, everybody said, but they were great days. They were great days for the kiddies. 
Perhaps I liked the new Picton. I didn't know. If there were things I hadn't noticed before, there were also things gone that I thought would be there forever. The two gum trees that I called the two ladies were gone. Or if they were there, I couldn't find them. And the track over the Domain Hill wasn't there. We used to climb up and watch the steamer coming in from the straits. And there was gorse mixed up with the bush, and the bush itself didn't hold the same fear, even with its secret, terrible drippings and rustlings that go on forever. There were more people in the town, too. The main trunk line brings more tourists, my aunt said. There were people everywhere, lying on the beach, being burned or browned by the sun and sea, people whizzing round the harbour in motor boats like the pop-pop boats we used to whiz round in the bath on Christmas morning, people surf-riding, playing tennis, fishing in the straits, practicing in skiffs for the regatta. People. But my grandmother wasn't there to show me everything and tell me stories, and the lagoon was dirtier than ever. See the lagoon, said my aunt, full of drifting wood and seaweed and crab's claws. We could see the lagoon from the kitchen window. We were looking at photographs that day. What silly clothes people wore in those days. There was Grandma sitting on the veranda with her knitting. And there was my great-grandmother, the Maori princess, with her big brown eyes and her lace dress on that her husband bought her. Handmade lace, said my aunt. He loved her till he met that woman from Nelson. Men are crazy sometimes, but I suppose women are crazier. Is there a story, I said? I was a child again. Grandma, tell me about... My aunt smiled. She guesses things sometimes. The sort of story they put in truth, she said. On the morning of the tragedy, witness saw defendant, etc., etc. Your great-grandmother was a murderess. She drowned her husband, pushed him in the lagoon. I suppose the tide was high. I don't know. They would call it the woman from Nelson, she mused. They would have photos. But then nobody knew, only the family. Everybody thought he got drunk and didn't know where he was going. My aunt drew aside the curtain and peered out. She reminded me of the women in films who turned to the window in an emotional moment. But the moment wasn't emotional, nor was my aunt. It's an interesting story, she said. I prefer Dostoevsky to truth. The water was brown and shining, and to the right lay the dark shadow of the Domain Hill, where the kids were playing on the edge, Christopher Robbins with sand between the toes, sailing toy warships and paddling with bare feet in the pools. Grandmother never told me, I said. Again, my aunt smiled. The reason, she quoted, one talks furthest from the heart is the fear that it may be hurt. And then my aunt dropped the curtain across the window and turned to the photographs again. Was it my aunt speaking, or was it my grandmother, or was it my great-grandmother who loved a white lace dress? At low tide, At low tide there is, there no, is lagoon. no lagoon, only a stretch, only a stretch of dirty, dirty gray, gray sand. sand. I remember, I remember we used, we used to, skim to skim thin white, white stones, stones over, the water over the water and catch, and catch tiddlers, tiddlers in the, the little, little creek nearby and make, make sandcastles. Sand this, this is my, my castle, castle, we said. You be father, I'll be, I'll mother, be mother, and we'll, and live, we'll here live here and catch, and crabs, catch crabs and tiddlers, and tiddlers forever. forever. That was The Lagoon by Janet Frame, read by Richard Hoffman. 
we thank you for listening to this Hoffman Studios Audiobook Club production.